back then, none of the studios were actually soundproof. So you could always hear what the others were working on. And I was working in my studio, I was hearing, you know, this piano melody coming from Maurizio Studios. And uh, I remember I thought, wow, this is beautiful. When I first heard the melody, it was a piano melody. But it was really hard to imagine where it would fit. And Massimo goes, uh, we're going to make a dance track out of it. And then we turned on the radio, and the song was there. That's when it really blew up. It was like, bang. I'm blue. We were on stage every single day, every single country in the world. The lyrics really threw off a lot of people. The track was really pushing people's minds. We wrote the song in two hours, but this is only the beginning. Damn. Yo, listen up, here's the story about a little guy that lives in a blue world. Like him, inside and outside. That's me. <laughs> can, you, can you believe it? <laughs> with the mesh, you know? With this kind of eyes, unbelievable. The first time I met music was when I was five years old. So for me, music was always part of my life. But uh, at that time, of course, I didn't think about music as a job. You know, it was only a something like a sport, you know, like I play soccer and I play piano, always play. The first time I know something about Blisco, I was 18 and they were looking for guys like me. And that's when I first met Jeffrey. We're headed to the Blisco studios. So this is where a great part of the magic happened. And uh, it still feels weird to walk in because it's been home for a long time. Blisco was and is a big studio and you had different kind of people working in it. There were musicians, singers, uh, producers, DJs, mainly to produce dance tracks that would end up on compilations and somehow create artists that would play the tracks live if it really worked out. At the age of about 11, I moved from Brooklyn to Sicily. But the singing process came in a little bit later. I was a, I was a George Michael fan when I was a kid. And I was listening to Careless Whisper, so I was like 17 back then. And I came into touring for a vacation. I said, the only thing I want to see is a music instrument store. And I started talking to this guy, and he goes, well, what kind of music do you produce? And I was like, you're not going to believe it. I have a tape with my song on it. So he picks up the phone. He calls Massimo Gabutti and he says, I got, a, I got someone here I think you could be interested in. So I hear some of his songs with a perfect English accent, perfect American accent. I say, is, it, is this you? I say, yes. Come on. It was him. Gabriel came to us and said, you know, they told me you're looking for DJ. And they said he could play as well. When I got to Blisco, I wasn't able to find the C on a keyboard. <laughs> I studied music afterwards. You know, I went to Massimo and said, look, I would like to be able to, to make my own music. So next day, 8.30, I was there. <laughs> this is what, you know, what fascinated me about the vision of Massimo. He understood the importance of a DJ inside his team. So the original Blisco was a small villa. We had a tree studio on the first floor. If you come, you could see a garden, then you could see kids going around and playing. One was Jeffrey, the other one was Maori, the other one was Gabri, the other one was me as well. It was a very creative workspace. Also, one funny thing is that none of the studios were actually soundproof, but it turned out to be very useful because um, every time you heard something you liked, from the next door, you could join and take part of the session. And that's exactly what happened with Blue. Blue came out in, in this way. 
I was playing with this piano roads and uh, this arpeggio. Well, the first time I heard the arpeggio of blue, let me explain the situation. My, my office was nothing else than the singing boot, and it was very near Maori's studio. Massimo, I remember that. He had to pass to my studio, even also to go to the bathroom. Come on, let's make something, uh, just transform it in a song. In one hour, we have something like an arrangement. It's always time to write some lyrics. So, OK, we call Jeff, Jeff is upstairs. So I wrote, like, in maybe 30 to 40 minutes, three different lyrics to the track. I, got, I go back to the studio to the guys, and I said, uh, OK, guys, I got three lyrics to this. There is one that's normal, one is so-so, and this is totally freaked out. Which one do you want first? And Maori goes, I want the freaked out one. The weird one is uh, something like a color, he said. Uh, color like, what? Well, something like I'm blue. What? Well, I'm blue, you, 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 what, what means? You're sad, you're blue, the color, so you're a smurf. You, you know, you, you have a lot of questions you can do. Just one with one title. And I understood that everybody had their own way of seeing things. And then I thought that the metaphor of a color would be great. As if you had your own personal lens with your own personal color, that you would filter the world and everything. And that's what, it, what got me into writing the lyrics. And what we had basically was the lyrics of the verse and of the chorus, of course which is the Daba D, Daba D, you know, the Daba D thing came in from Massimo. He goes, why don't we just don't use words here and put in something that is so international that anybody can sing it. So that came my contribution, which is something that can be sung by a kid or can be sung by a crowd of football fans. They trust me, I don't know why. And believe it or not, what you're listening to today is exactly what I recorded that day. We never sang it again. In fact, that take, exactly as it is, is one version, which is called Dob version. Then another version came out, which was a little bit more elaborated, uh, which was called uh, Glamo Cart. If you listen to the Glamo mix, uh, you can notice the many things are already there. It was the version that inspired me for many other things that I put in on the main mix. And um, a few days have gone by, and I walk down to the studio, and I, I walk in, and there's Maori working with Gabri on the track. The first time I heard Blue, it wasn't Blue yet. One day, I was downstairs, and I was uh, listening to the track, and I thought, uh, the arrangement is wrong. So I said, hey guys, I have a different, you know, vision on how this should sound. I would like to work on it. Me and Gabriel worked together um, at the end of the production of the main version, but I don't remember exactly what he puts. It was some little decision uh, in the arrangements probably. But if I have to tell, if you ask me about what he puts that wasn't in the tracks. I'm sorry, but I don't remember. We sat down together in the studio, listening to references, sampling sounds. It was like two days in a studio. Gabri put his hands with Maori, and it came out the, the version that actually everybody knows as Blue. I'm blue. Ah, we, we got the old session of Blue, the original one. And the original version was something like 15 tracks. Like this. And then comes the percussion, for example, which was a clap, a clap and a hat, nothing else. If you... So this is the, the rhythm session of Blue. Three, three elements. And uh, the, vocals, uh, the vocals are Jeffrey, vocals plus vocoder. That year, in 1998, um, Cher had released this beautiful song called Believe. And, um, and it has this peculiar effect on, on her voice. Do you believe in love love? And we were like, 
oh my God, how can we recreate this effect? Problem is that we didn't quite get there because it was the wrong effect, you know? <laughs> uh, what Cher had used was, uh, was the auto-tune. We call it vocoder, but it's not a vocoder, as I told you. It was an harmonizer playing with a, with a, with a MIDI keyboard, the, the, the voice of Jeffrey. You can notice that the piano do the same kind of stuff as the vocal. Uh, not this one, but this one. And if you listen to the vocal, it's a little bit unnatural. If you listen to the verse, I have a blue house with a blue window. This is the real voice of Jeff. Blue is the color. I Just here. Okay. It was a choice. It was an artistic choice. When we were done, we were so happy about the result and so excited. So we wanted to test it live. So we go to this club, we play the track, and it was a disaster. <laughs> oh my God. It emptied the dance floor. It was, you know, as if I screamed at the microphone, hey people, go to the bar, drinks are free. So I remember we, you know, we looked at each other and uh, say, okay, let's move to the next one. <laughs> we pressed 1,000 vinyls and it was a flop. We sold barely 200. Blue was too pop for the dance floor and to dance for the radios. It was in the middle. It was in the fucking middle. Luckily, after some time, it turned out to be also its greatest power. It was spring 99. Blue was out in the stores. Nothing was happening. So personally, I moved on to producing a lot of stuff. You would end up forgetting about it. And a friend of mine from Sicily called me and he says, oh, I got your track, Blue, and I'm playing it. I was like, Blue what? I, didn't even, I couldn't remember the track. He goes, man, when I play this, when, when the chorus kicks in, people start jumping all over the place. It gets to Radio DJ, and it was the 1st of April, 1999. I cannot forget it. That's when it really blew up. It was like, bang. From the time that it hit the radio to the time that we actually got on a stage, it was a matter of days. We were on stage every single day. We found ourselves playing between Destiny's Childs and Bon Jovi uh, or Sugar Ray. You know, your, your mind says, this is a one in a lifetime opportunity. You're never gonna have this again. So you have to take whatever comes in. 15 million of copies, platinum records, diamond records, silver records, gold records, every single country in the world. We would like to start and say thank you to our big family in Torino, and we'd like to thank them from the bottom of our heart. Thank you, Blizz Corporation, from IFA, straight to you. The biggest achievement, uh, I think, the one that gave us more personal satisfaction was to see this, our song rise the billboard charts. And, uh, you know, USA is a big market. And it was an alien market for dance music by then. It was like, wow, this European dance music, for the first time, is kind of making it in USA. And then the US tour, considered that the big dance and electronic festivals that we know today weren't existing. Some of them were like ultra music festival, but I mean, it was like seven, eight years before uh, guys like David Guetta or Black Eyed Peas made it mainstream. I realized that we were totally out of context. We were uh, dressing like, uh, I can I say, aliens, uh, astronauts, which was for us a way to, I can I say, be different. We are on the way to Radio DJ. Radio DJ is, uh, is one of the most important radio stations in Italy. It played a key role in, in the story of Blue. Hey, from 65, yo, yo listen up, here's the story. Pari del diavolo, eh? E c'è qui Gabri Ponte, c'è qui Gabri Ponte. Bravo, Gabri! Bravo, Gabri!
Eh, citiamo ovviamente quando si parla di Eiffel anche Mauri, Mauri Jeffrey, e Jeffrey, e Massimo, e tutto il gruppo che ha... Tra l'altro diciamo perché siamo qui oggi. Eh, infatti vorrei che tu dicessi perché sei qui. Eh, da me oggi ho pensato di coinvolgerli in questa piccola chiacchierata con te, visto che insomma sei stato anche uno dei fautori del successo di questo disco. Infatti, mi sono arricchito anch'io grazie agli Eiffel 65. No, vabbè, eh, tu lo sai cosa penso di questa cosa? Io sono molto... Eh, orgoglioso no? di essere stato tra i promotori qui in Italia e da, e da qui che è partito tutto. Sì. Io mi ricordo ancora la data, pensa a te. Ma veramente? Eh sì, me la ricordo. Che giorno era? Era il primo di aprile del 1999. Mi ricordo perché quando me l'hanno detto ho pensato sarà uno scherzo, no? cioè eh, primo di aprile. E invece poi era vero, insomma, siamo andati in macchina, abbiamo acceso la radio, eh, c'era Albertino che diceva questo è blu degli Eiffel 65. Questo è blu degli Eiffel 65 <ride> su Radio DJ, One Nation, One Station. E chiudiamo così la puntata di giovedì 29 novembre. As you can tell in the video, I'm freezed and taken away. And uh, as, as being freezed, I don't know what's going on. So it's like me playing and all of a sudden just waking up and there's a whole bunch of aliens dancing and waving their hands at me. And in the meantime, Gabri and, and Maori are trying to get to me. We were just reflecting on what, at the time, were the video games we were playing, you know, Metal Gear Solid or stuff like that. Jeffrey was the one who told me we can use the, um, the ambient and the atmosphere of, the me of Metal Gear Solid and we can find a story inside of a 3D world. I never read the, the comments actually. <laughs> Better than Despacito. <laughs> I'm blue, I'm a Beat up a guy, I would. Oh my god. I would pee on a guy. <laughs> I will need an apple pie. <laughs> this one is um, ah, it's very fun. You know, this WD Dabu Die, we didn't put the words, and every single person in the world put some words in the nonsense uh, melody. Basically, for the record, it's just da ba di da ba dai. We got to Germany and they said, okay, blue, blue means drunk around here. The track was really pushing people's minds into un understanding things that were not there. And in England, they said, why are you writing that someone is sad? I'm not writing anybody sad. One guy came up to me and says, do you really say if I was green, I would die? He said, yo, dude, the name of the track is blue. And why the hell would I sing if I was green? I would die. <laughs> Grazie, Gabri, ti voglio bene. <coughs> Ciao. Ma mi hanno detto una roba che fa molto ridere degli Eiffel. <coughs> che, Ciao. Che fanno le serate insieme, ma ognuno mangia per i cazzi suoi, non si parlano, discutono molto. Proprio lavoro, eh? eh? Proprio lavoro, lavoro. Peccato. C'è un motivo se ho fatto le scelte che ho fatto. Peccato. Vabbè, Beh, dai. Pare come un matrimonio, eh? è difficile andare d'accordo. Well, you know, you have to see a band like a family. And obviously you can't always be, you know, happy, you can't always get along together. In 2003, 2004, we were losing a lot of money. Why? Is because Gabri had a lot of intentions to have his own personal career which is great to work out. But if Gabri was, was gigging on his own, we, we could not be gigging as I felt. And so uh, we came to the point where actually we thought it was a better idea to have the gigs done with Maori and I alone. But I really don't know all the real in-depth things that could have been between Maori and Gabri. I know that Maori probably doesn't like a few things that happened between him and, and, uh, and Gabri. You know, we... We got together by chance, by little chance. And uh, also when, when Blue came out, our artistically speaking, our personalities uh, were not totally developed yet. So I started my solo project in parallel. And so we kind of 
drifted apart. But we never fight together. Never, never. And then life changed, you know, life changed. Money changed, popularity changed the people. And for me in blue, it happened in the last two, probably one or two days of the last things I did. If I have to tell you one details that I remember that it changed in the, in the version, I don't remember. I wrote Blue with Jeffrey and Massimo. So we are the fathers of that song. I never thought I was the, the father of the song, of course. On the other side, if you take a look at the first record of Blue, and I mean, with the original credits, it bears my name. So, I mean, uh, it must be a reason why. Maybe after some time, you know, somebody tends to forget some things, you know, 20 years have passed, but the truth is that Eiffel, not only Blue, but Eiffel was always a teamwork. This has to be remembered. We did something very big together. This is what I, this is what I believe. I, I, I'm not, you know, focused on who did what. I know exactly what I did and I'm very proud of it. He has a good career, he's famous here in Italy. He, he got a lot of uh, TV shows. Yeah, he could be proud of himself for what it, what it does. I'm more focused on uh, having my music more famous than me. We're going to the live club. Personally, it's one of my favorites. It's loaded with a lot of people. I think that the good thing about doing it now, compared to back then, is that, that our music has passed generations through generations. You know, passing it on to their kids. And it feels like Wu just came out. I'm a lucky guy. I have to say that I'm a real lucky guy. You know, things like this really don't happen often to people. And when they do, you really do have to understand that it's not just a matter of talent, it's a matter of luck. What could be better than living thanks to my passion? If I could say something about the impact of Blue, maybe create a generation of Italian producer that they were aiming for the world not only for the next disco. It obviously changed my life, totally. I was just a guy working, you know, in a basement, <laughs> trying to make music, and so I'm very grateful to Blue and to all the disco people for that. Blue changed my life in so many ways. First of all, makes me proud of myself. Because before Blue, for example, me, I don't remember how many singles I failed before Blue. And you have to mention them to understand why people like me, Jeffrey Massimo, can write a song in two hours. It's not a question of we made a song in two hours, but we make a life that leads you in those two hours to make the song. Yo, listen up, here's the story about a little guy that lives in a blue world and all day and all night and everything he sees is just blue like him inside and outside blue his house with a blue little window and a blue corvette and everything is blue for him and everybody around cause he ain't got nobody to listen, to listen. I'm blue.